Hi guys, welcome back to another true crime video. So, for this video, I will be discussing the death of Travis Alexander by his ex-girlfriend, Jody Arias. Now, this happened back in 2008, so it's a little old, but it's kind of come back into the spotlight recently because of the whole reason why I wanted to discuss this video in the first place was because I actually got a video suggesting me to watch the documentary about this murder. So, I thought I would go ahead and talk about this one because it really did capture my attention by what happened and how gruesome this story is. And I know a few of, a few of you have requested me to do different videos for true crime, um, but this one I wanted to go ahead and make, and then don't worry, I will be making the ones that you have requested in the next true crime video. So, without further ado, we will go ahead and get started. I do want to tell a little bit of a background for both Jody and Travis. So, um, for Travis, he was born in California, and he had... Um, a lot of siblings and lived with his parents, but his parents were addicted to crystal meth, so the kids all were growing up pretty much without parents. And it was said that they would have to rummage through the pantry, through the fridge, through wherever they could find some type of food to eat because um, when their parents would do crystal meth, they would fall asleep for days, and the kids were all very young, so they didn't have a way to go get groceries on their own, so they would just have to deal with either what was at the house, and sometimes they would have to eat food that was rotten. So, very sad he grew up not in the best home situation. I think he had a brother and a sister. He may have had more siblings, but I'm they didn't really discuss um, them into a lot of detail because only two of them talked about Travis and the death of him tragically. So, um, what ended up happening is they moved in with their grandmother and she took care of all of them and raised them in the Mormon church. So, Travis did grow up Mormon and he was huge into the Mormon community. He would go to church all the time, and he actually had a passion to one day marry a Mormon girl who was a virgin. So, throughout his entire teenage to adult years, he was supposedly a virgin. So, that's his story for right now. And then for Jody, Jody was also born in California in Eureka or Wairika, California, and she had a very good home life. She had both of her parents, and she had siblings as well. She was a little bit quieter. Um, she loved to go and take pictures of nature. She loved the outdoors, and she was really into photography. So, in school, that was something that she really gravitated towards, and then once she got out of school, she had a desire to make that a full-time job. So she actually moved, um, I don't remember exactly where in California she moved, but she left Wairika and moved to a different part of California to pursue that dream. And sadly, it did not work out. So in 2006, she joined an MLM, which is a multi-level marketing company, and it was pretty much what I what I was reading, it was a multi-level marketing company that would help people get lawyers if they didn't have the money to pay for them. And, um, Travis Alexander was also part of this MLM. He was very high in the company. He actually got introduced to the, commu to the um, company through a friend who he knew in his Mormon church. 
and he was 28, I think, at this time when he was in that MLM, and he had skyrocketed up the company, and Jody had just gotten involved in the company in 2006, and they were having a huge convention in Las Vegas in September. So, Jody was a part of somebody else's team, but that guy who was her leader knew Travis. So, they all went to the convention, and since Travis was high up in the company, he talked on stage, and he was a, um, a person that would be the motivational speaker, so everybody really liked him, everybody who knew him just had fallen in love with who he was, and so Jody kind of gravitated towards him because of that reason, but of course she didn't know him, so the guy who she was under in the company knew that Travis was single and was looking for somebody to potentially marry one day or just date, so he went up to Travis and told him that he has this really attractive girl named Jody on his team, and he would love for them to meet. So, that night, they all met up, and Jody and Travis were introduced to each other, and the moment they met, they had an, a, a physical attraction to each other. So, since Travis was high up in the company, they have these side events that the top like 1% go to. So Travis actually invited Jody to come to the dinner with him. So they were at the dinner, they were talking, getting to know each other, and they realized they had a lot in common. So they ended up really enjoying the weekend, getting to know each other better. But after the weekend was over, they did have to go their separate ways. So Jody lived in California. And then Travis lived in Mesa, Arizona. So they did decide that they wanted to continue to talk, but that they would have to do a long distance relationship. So Jody and Travis would take turns driving to one another's locations where they lived to see each other. And Jody um, found this book called a thousand places to see before you die. It was either Jody or it may have been Travis that found it. One of the two found the book and they both had talked about previously how they loved to travel. So their idea of getting together um, when they would go see each other was to go do something on that book and cross it off of their bucket list. Because before they were just talking on the phone all the time, getting to know each other better. And then once they felt comfortable, they decided to start dating and, and traveling together. So that's exactly what they did. They would go on tons of different trips together, and they really were enamored with each other. They were really getting serious really fast, and like I said earlier, Travis was Mormon, so if you know anything about the Mormon community, they are huge on not having sex before marriage. Well, Jody was not Mormon. She had had previous relationships. She had had sex before. And like I said, supposedly Travis was a virgin. So when they got together, their physical attraction definitely turned into more physical attraction and they ended up having sex. Well, they were having a lot of sex, doing a lot of fantasy type things together. You know, Travis had never had sex, so he had all these fantasies that he wanted to fulfill and Jody was down to do whatever he wanted to do because she was obsessed with him just as much as he was with her. So, they decided that they needed to take a step back. It was more Travis than Jody because of his Mormon 
religion, he decided that he would send some Mormon um, boys to come speak to her at her house to tell her more about the Mormon book and what they believed in. And Jodi was pretty open-minded, so she was willing to read the book, find out more about it, and she wanted to do it for Travis. So, she ended up converting to a Mormon in November of 2006. So, they met in September of 2006, and she became a Mormon in November of 2006. And he was actually the one to baptize her. And so, this was great, they thought, for their relationship. Jody was hoping that this would bring them even closer together. But what she didn't realize was that since they had already had sex, Travis, not that he didn't want to be with her, but more of since he had always had the dream of marrying a girl that was a virgin, the marriage was out of the question for Judy and Travis. And so, he really did like her though, and he wanted to continue to date her, and he liked what they had in the bedroom. Even though they both were saying to people who were Mormon and around their community that they were not having sex anymore, or I don't even know if people knew they were having sex, but they were keeping it quiet so that they would not get shunned for it. And so they continued to have sex behind closed doors. And um, Travis hung out with the majority of people that were Mormon. So when they would go to functions together, most of them were Mormon, but Jody, of course, had never been Mormon, so she was still very touchy-feely with him in front of them, and she would kiss on him and love on him, and he kind of would be more reserved in front of other people because that was just not how they were supposed to act in front of each other or in front of other people. So one day, the guy who got Travis started in the MLM company invited them, invited Travis and Jody to come over to his house and spend the weekend with him and his wife. So they, the first time they met Jody, they liked her. They thought she was super sweet. Everybody who had first met Jody said she's like the girl next door. She was so kind and just such a soft spoke, soft spoken person. And so when they went and spent the weekend with them, the couple started noticing some weird things about Jody. She became very obsessive over Travis. She didn't like when Travis was not giving her that 100% attention. She didn't like seeing Travis talk to other girls in front of her. She was just very possessive and she would always be right next to him, following him to the bathroom, not really giving him his time alone. She would always sit right next to him when they were sitting somewhere. And so the other couple noticed how weird it was that she was just always right next to him and it would never give him his own space. Also, one of the nights that they were at the house, they decided to all get into the hot tub. So Jody and Travis were sitting next to each other and then the other couple were sitting next to each other on the other side of the hot tub. Well, they were all mid-conversation. Jody was very quiet, so she was not talking. Travis knew the other couple very well, so they were conversing back and forth, having a great conversation. And out of nowhere, Jody decides to get up and straddle Travis in the hot tub right in front of the other couple and start kissing all over him, kissing on his neck, just being very inappropriate right in front of the other couple, which of course they thought this was really weird. They were like, okay, did she not see that we're sitting right here? And so that was probably the first time they were like, hmm, something's really off with this girl, especially with how clingy she is towards Travis. And so the last day that they were there, 
um, the couple pulled Travis aside and went up to their bedroom and told Travis that they felt like something was off with Jody. And he was like, there's no way anything's wrong with her. She's the sweetest person I've ever met. And they were like, no, something is wrong with her. Do you not see how controlling and possessive she is over you? And he was like, well, she just really likes me. I really like her. And they were like, you need to break up with her. Like, I'm worried that we're going to find you cut up in her freezer one day. Like, that's how crazy she seems to us. And he just kind of looked at them weird and could and he couldn't believe what they were telling him. And they were all sitting there just talking about his relationship with her, what next step he needed to take. And the woman that was in the marriage with the guy that he was really good friends with, she said she got this really weird feeling that had come over her. And she told Travis, she like lips, lipped it to him or however you say that, like she just kind of was like, hey, she's out there. She was outside of the bedroom, and Travis was like, there's no way, and she was like, I swear she's out there listening to us talking right now. And so what he did to see if the lady was being honest was he tiptoed over to the door, and he grabbed the door and swung it open as fast as he could, so Jody couldn't run away, and when he opened the door, Jody was standing there with this, the most evil look on her face, like, how dare you, and so that's when the couple felt very uncomfortable to have her in their house, and they told Travis that she was no longer welcome back in their house ever again, and that they needed to leave, so Travis was talking to the guy, getting all their stuff ready to go, and the lady was walking down the stairs, and Jody saw her and stopped her, and pretty much confronted her about what they were talking about upstairs, and she said, are you trying to get Travis to break up with me? And she goes, yes, I am, because I don't trust you, you're very scary, and I don't know what's wrong with you, and she goes, how dare you do that? How are you going to, why are you trying to make him break up with me? And she was like, because you need to get help. There is something seriously wrong with you. You are so controlling over him. You've only known him for a few months. Like, you need to get a grip. And she just starts bawling her eyes out. So the lady knew, like, this girl, something was wrong with her. So Travis and her left, Travis and Jody left that house and, um, Pretty much, they continued to talk for a while, but Travis did start seeing all of the things that his friends were telling him about her, and he just realized, like, maybe they're right, maybe I should get out of this relationship, and Jody was just becoming more and more possessive and controlling over him. And there was one night that she got a hold of his phone and his emails, and supposedly she found text messages of him talking to other girls, being very flirty, and so she ended the relationship between the two of them, which Travis obviously was trying to find a way to get out of the relationship, so he was fine with them breaking up, and so they split and Jody went back to California, and Travis was in Mesa, Arizona, trying to get his life back on track. Well, so, I think it was not even a week after they had broken up, Jody decided to move to Mesa, Arizona, where Travis lived, and she was only 10 minutes away from where he lived. Well, this was very creepy to Travis because he was like, what is wrong with this chick? We were living separately this whole time and we were driving back and forth to meet with each other when we were dating and now we're not together and she wants to be right next to me and closer to me. So all this started getting very sketchy to him, but the only problem was that he couldn't cut ties with her because he was 
obsessed with their sex life. She had given him everything he possibly could have wanted when it came to fantasies and all of that. So even though they were broken up, they were still talking on the phone, still um, having very sexual conversations, and it got to the point where they were having phone sex. Even though Travis was talking to other girls, trying to move on from Jody, he was also talking to other Mormon girls that he was interested in, hoping to find a girl that he could one day call his wife. But Jody and him were still meeting up on occasions while she was living there to have sex because, like I said, he just could not cut ties with that and Jody was obsessed with him, so she did whatever he wanted her to do. And so, while she was living there, they kind of were still going back and forth. Well, one day, Travis finally looked at her and goes, we have to cut this out. Like, we've got it in this relationship. This is so unhealthy for both of us. We need to go our separate ways. And Jody agreed. So Jody decided to pick up and move back to Wairika with her family. And of course, Travis stayed in Arizona. And this was in 2007 when all this was going on. So they had already been dating for about a year. Well, they were dating for about four or five months and then broke up and then she moved. So it was already in 2007 when all this was going on. So she moved back home and Travis was now dating a different girl and he was really interested in her and um, Jody found out about it and she was going through his Facebook, his emails. She had like all of his password and stuff. I don't know why, but she did. And so she could access all of his information and she knew exactly who this girl was. And so she would um, take trips down to Mesa, Arizona. It was about a five hour drive from where she lived in California. I'm sorry, I'm sick. So my it's really hard for me to talk right now. Um, I keep getting choked up. So forgive me, but, um, so she would drive back and forth and do some really sketchy stuff to Travis and the other girl. There were nights where she would go and knock on different doors and windows of his house, knowing that him and the other girl were in there together, and she had slashed his tires, she had written the girl this really nasty email pretty much saying, like, you're going to go to hell because you're doing all this stuff with Travis and blah blah blah. You're supposed to be Mormon, follow the Mormon um, religion, all this stuff. Well, so that girl was just completely freaked out at this point. So she told Travis that she couldn't continue the relationship that they were trying to build together because of Jody and that he needed to get that figured out because it was getting out of control. So pretty much that relationship ended and Jody and um, Travis still are in contact with each other and and so Travis told Jody like she is crazy she needs to get help she needs to leave him alone and so there was a period in to the end of 2007 starting 2008 where they didn't really talk they had no communication. He was moving on with his life. He was telling all of his friends how happy he was to get his life back on track without Jody in the picture. And that he really wanted to start new and start looking for his future wife. Because I think at this time he was already 31. And so he really needed to hurry it up. Because he really did want to get married and start having a family. So... He, in 2008, started dating this girl that was Mormon. Um, I don't think they were dating, but he was really into her. She wasn't really into him that much, but he was determined to win her over. And then Jody started dating this other guy who was also Mormon, and he lived in Utah. I think he worked for the same company that Travis worked for. And so, in... 
um, around May of 2008, they were both in different relationships or talking to different people. And, and um, Travis had planned on going to Cancun, Mexico with the girl that he was talking to. And he wanted to bring her in his um, community so that he could shine, show her who he was and how outgoing he was in the couple that I had mentioned previously that had gotten him started in the company were going to be there. So he wanted them to help him out and have the girl like be around them and for them to tell the girl how amazing Travis was and all of this stuff. So they were supposed to go on this trip in June and it was a company trip so it was paid for and he was just going to bring the girl with him. Jody was supposed to go with him on this trip, but since they were no longer dating, that was not going to happen. And I think that made Jody very jealous. But um, Jody, of course, was talking to this other guy, and she had made plans to also go meet up with the guy from Utah around the same time that Travis was supposed to go on this vacation. So it was the very beginning of June and Travis was supposed to leave for his trip I think on June 5th and Jody was going that weekend to visit the guy that she was talking to um I think it was June 3rd so she packed up all of her stuff was heading out to leave Wairika to go to Utah and she said that Travis sent her a text message after he knew that she was going on this trip, that he wanted her to stop by, if she could, in Mesa, Arizona, on her way to Utah to see him for a little rendezvous. And she said that, that wasn't a very good idea, but she did it anyways. So, June 3rd, she ended up driving to Mesa, Arizona, and she ended up getting there super late. I think it was like 3 a.m. in the morning of June 4th. And she said when she walked into the house that the Travis was on his computer watching some YouTube videos. And so, they were talking for a little bit. And she said that night they did not have sex. They were just talking, and then they went to bed about 4 a.m., and she said they woke up the next morning at 1 p.m. and they had sex twice. And um, he was getting ready for his trip, but they decided that they were going to take pictures of them having sex. And so they were using this specific camera. And there's tons of pictures that were snapped during that day. And... Um, they were just having a good time, but nobody actually knows exactly what happened um, from that point until Travis died. But pretty much June 4th happened. They had had their moments together. Like I said, they woke up at 1 p.m. Well, the pictures that were being taken were being snapped around 5.30, and these pictures were of Travis in the shower. He was in the shower leaning against it, you know, just taking a shower, and nobody really knows if these pictures were meant for a sexual reason, meant for he wanted her to take them, no idea, but they were on the camera. So, I will put a few of them up here so you can see, um, but the pictures were snapped on the camera around 5.30, and the last picture that was taken was of Travis looking into the camera almost like he was surprised that the pictures were being taken because the other ones were him not facing the camera. So nobody knows if he knew they were being taken in the first place, but from that last picture, it looks like he had no idea or something was going on behind the camera that scared him. So from here, this is where it gets crazy. So, Jody um, has three different stories as to what truly happened, but I will tell you what happened, how he died first, and then I will tell you what she told the authorities. So, 
Jody um, had a gun, and they found out that she did have a gun and a knife in her car, and she had three cans of gasoline that were full, and she did this so that they could not track her from ever going from California. She did this so that they could not track her going from California to Mesa, Arizona, but pretty much that day, after they had had sex, Travis had gotten in the shower, pictures were taken, he was terrified or looked scared in that picture. And from that moment, three other pictures were snapped with the camera falling. And Jody says that they got in a heated conversation that he was very mad because she dropped the camera while she was taking pictures. And that's what caused him or caused her to kill him. So pretty much what happened was she took the gun and she shot him in the head and then she slit his throat and she stabbed him 27 times. But when you look at the forensic evidence, you do see there's blood all throughout the bathroom part in part of his room and then down his hallway that leads to his door and that would go into like the main part of the house. Well, there's blood just everywhere, like smeared across the ground. And so you can tell that he was trying to crawl his way to the door, to the front door, to get out, to get help. Well, she dragged him back into the bathroom and put him in the t into the shower and continued to stab him. And they said on the forensic evidence that the gun isn't what killed him. It was a specific stab wound from the back that was, um, punctured his heart and then, um, the slashing of his throat. So they said that he was slashed from ear to ear and sadly the pictures have been leaked of his death and what he looked like. If you are interested in going to check those out, if that's something you're into, you can go look at those, but I'm not going to post them on here because they are very gruesome and hard to look at. But yes, she did stab him over 27 times and left him in the shower. And she did leave his house. She locked the bedroom door and left and got in her car. And she went and still visited the guy in Utah. She was only there for 24 hours. And she said, or the guy told the police that they did not have sex. All they did was make out on the couch while they were watching a movie that night. And they asked the guy if she had had any cuts on her hands. And they said, or he said that she only had a few little bitty ones on her hands. And that was it. Oh, so, um, pretty much what happens from here is that Jody drives back to her hometown, Wairika, where she lived with her family in California. And, um, from June 4th, when... Travis was killed until June 9th. Nobody knew that Travis was even dead. Um, the couple that he was supposed to meet up with in Cancun had been trying to get a hold of him the whole time they were on the trip, and they kept calling him, asking him, like, hey, what um, excursions do you want to take, all this stuff, and he wasn't responding, so they were definitely worried, and, um, the guy that was really good friends with him had admitted that he had called Travis, I don't remember what day it was, but he was pretty much like, hey dude, you you better be dead, like why are you missing so many phone calls? But he said he was just kidding, he didn't know what was going on, but he just knew it was not like Travis to miss these events, miss these um, trips, and he had missed a huge call, like a conference call that he was supposed to um, lead, and that's when everybody really started to get worried. So the girl he was supposed to take on the trip with him to Cancun, um, really started to get worried because they were supposed to leave for their trip, um, I think it was the next day, so June 5th or June 6th, one of the two, and he never showed up at her house to pick her up. So, she started contacting his friends, being like, hey, he hasn't shown up, I don't know what's going on, and so on June 9th, 
they decided to try to go over to his house and figure out what was going on. So Travis lived in this, I think it was a four bedroom house, so he had rented out two of his bedrooms to some friends and um, they knocked on the front door, nobody answered, so they called a friend that knew his um, passcode and they got into the house. <coughs> they got into the house and saw that one of the guys that lived there was actually there. And they knocked on his door and they're like, hey, have you seen Travis? Have you seen Travis? And the guy was like, no, he's supposed to be in Cancun. And the girl that Travis was supposed to take was standing right there. And she goes, no, he's not in Cancun because I was supposed to go with him. And Travis always had a like master key to his bedroom because he did live in the master of the house. So he gave him the spare key and they went into the bedroom and that's when they like they were hit in the face with this awful rotten smell and Travis had been in there for five days already or four days so that's why the smell was so strong and it's weird that like his his uh the people that lived in his house like weren't smelling it like they didn't they even said like they had no idea he was even in there they thought he was gone they weren't smelling that smell so it's like it had blocked into his room and he was all the way in the bathroom so i think that's why the smell never got outside of the room and so when they walked in they saw the trail of blood all the way down the hallway that was um, leading to his bedroom and then when you took a left that was where the bathroom was and so one of the friends walked into the bathroom and saw his body smushed pretty much like just slammed into or smushed into the shower and it's one of the stand-up showers so it's not very big and his body was just laying there lifeless and so they called 911 and they were like hey our friend is dead we don't know what happened like this is insane can you please come here and help us and so the authorities get involved and everybody's asking like who could do this why would anybody do this i mean if you think about it his neck was slashed he'd been stabbed 27 times and he was shot in the head so pretty much he had been murdered three times over and so they knew this was a murder that was um someone was out for revenge over him and so that's the first question they started asking people was who, did he have anybody in his life that was trying to hurt him? Did he have any enemies, anything like that? And everybody said, you need to look at his ex-girlfriend, Jody Arias. So they found out where she lived. The authorities went to her house, um, talked to her about coming in just to get some um, DNA samples of her and all of that, some fingerprints, just standard stuff that you would do when you are looking for someone who had passed away and you need all the people who are closest to them to come in for, you know, just to make sure that they didn't do it. So Jody, of course, was like, okay, I'll come in. But the weirdest thing that she said was like, can I put my makeup on first? So the cop already thought this was so weird that she had even asked that before she came in to get her DNA samples. Um, but she went in there. They already had all of this evidence against her because they were in Travis's house for three days straight trying to gather all the evidence they possibly could. And they found her hair had been pulled out, obviously because Travis was trying to fight back. Her hair had been pulled out. There was parts of it all over the place. Um, her DNA and her blood was mixed with um, different areas of Travis's blood in that, in that, or in the bedroom. So, they already knew that she had been there, and they also found the camera where the pictures had been taken, only because the bed sheets were ripped off the bed. So, they immediately went down to the, um, laundry room and looked into the washer, and the sheets were not in there, but they did find a camera. The camera had been deleted, but there was a memory card still in there, so the forensic evidence got a hold of it and tried to reboot the camera and see what was on there. 
and that's where they found all of those pictures that she had taken of him and the time stamps of when they were taken. And there was a few more that had been taken that looked like they had been snapped of her actually killing him. Well, so the cop knew that she had been a part of it somehow and he asked her if she had been in Mesa, Arizona at the time of his death and the first thing she told him was no, absolutely not. I did was not there. I haven't seen him since like April and so um, the cop was pretty much like, I know you're lying. I have all this evidence against you. She was just denying it. I mean, he had pictures of her that he was showing her with the timestamp and she's like, that's not me. He was like, I have a, a handprint that has your blood on it and she was like, that, that's not mine. Like, she just would not admit anything. Well, so, obviously, they let her leave, and then, um, a few months later, they did end up finding enough evidence against her to arrest her. So, she was arrested for, um, having some part of his murder. They didn't know exactly how it had happened yet, or why it had happened, but, um, she was convicted of his murder, then, when they were doing her trial, she tried to change her story, and her second story was that she had been um, there with him, they had had an amazing night, they had slept together, blah 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 blah, and then two intruders had come into his house, and they had shot him in the head, and they were trying to decide what to do with her, but that the guy it was supposedly one of the intruders had gone downstairs and he um, left her up there with the other person that was supposedly a girl and Travis had already been shot like but he was still alive and Jody supposedly got up and ran into the girl and got away so she left there or left Travis to fend for himself supposedly drove into the desert and tried to get rid of any evidence possible that she was even there. Of course, the cops did not believe any of this that she was saying, and um, then when she was on her actual, like, murder trial for the conviction of killing Travis, she made up another story saying that she did kill Travis, but it was out of self-defense because he had gotten upset that the camera had fallen and it had broken, and that he ended up having all this rage and he decided to go after her. Well, she somehow got a hold of a gun, shot him in the head, slit his throat, and then stabbed him 27 times. And this was her way of defending herself. Well, all the people that were on the um, stand that knew Travis, they all admitted that Travis did not have a mean bone in his body. He was one of the nicest men they've ever met. He never had any ill will towards people. He was so kind. He never lashed out at people, so they knew she was lying. Well, she did end up getting convicted of his murder. And she is now living her life in prison without any possibility of parole. But she still is saying that she killed him out of self-defense. And one of the craziest things that I saw just recently um, on YouTube was that she was all about the publicity of this murder. Um, she was being interviewed by a CBS or NBC, one of the two. They had come to her jail cell after she had been convicted. And she was having like a regular conversation with them, pretty much asking them questions like what they had, um, what they knew about her, blah, 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 like trying to make sure that she was in the spotlight. Um, and that her, her story had gotten out, and she didn't know the cameras were rolling, but they were. She was like, can I put my makeup on really quick? And she starts, like, putting powder on her face. She's like, don't let the cameras roll yet. So this girl literally killed the love of her life, and now she is living the limelight of being this killer and taking this poor guy's life and... She just is pure evil, and I thought this story was so crazy because she did it out of jealousy, pure jealousy, because she couldn't be with him, so she decided to take his life, and the only thing that ever made her cry throughout the entire 
um, conviction was that she was not going to be able to live the life that she wanted with her family and she wasn't going to be able to do anything free or on her own anymore. She had to do everything by what the judicial system was going to tell her she had to do. So it's very sad. I mean, she had no sympathy towards what she did whatsoever. The only thing she did say was that she hopes that now that she's been convicted that her family will find peace from it. Which is so sad. I mean, he was such an amazing person by what people were saying and he just happened to have a fatal attraction to her and it got him killed. So, I thought that story was a great one to talk about. Like I said, if you want to go look at some of the pictures, you can that I haven't put up here. But I really hope that you enjoyed this true crime video. I am trying to do at least one a month because I know you guys really like them. So, I will definitely make that a goal to do one a month for you. But um, that is going to be it. Thank you so much for watching and I will see you in the next video.